saving grace how sweet the sound the saved a rich like me I was was lost then now I'm found was blind then now I see Taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed.
everyone. Welcome here to our Good Friday service. Thanks for joining us this morning as we come and remember the cross. Uh, just a couple points of communication. As you look around, our, our elementary students are here with us. And so elementary students, out in the lobby, if you miss it, there is activity packages. You can grab one of those um, if you'd like. Second, as you came in, there was popsicle sticks. There are popsicle sticks on your chair. And some of you are like, man, what is this for? And then, don't worry, <laughs> it'll come. Pastor Lisa will explain at the tail end of the message what those will be used for. Uh, but hang on to them, don't throw them, etc. Third, as we come to a close with our service, we are going to be coming around the communion table. Um, and as Pastor Lisa said that in the first service, there was this response of, oh, I didn't get communion. And maybe some of you going, oh, I didn't. All is well. There isn't communion out there. The communion's up at the front. And Pastor Lisa will give instruction and invitation to come grab the elements and participate. She'll, she'll give those directions. This service this morning will, does look a little bit different. Will look a little bit different. Um, our, our normal mode of operation is to stand, to worship through song, and sit and listen. But it's going to be a little bit different. There's going to be songs. There's going to be some hearing of the word um, from the team and from Pastor Lisa sharing a message. But in all of that, wor worship as you feel led. So as we come to song, feel free to stay seated if you'd like. If you'd like to stand, he feel free to stand. If you'd like to kneel, whatever posture you want to take in the midst of worship this morning, you are welcome to do so. I just want to pray now to start our service. Would you join me in prayer? So Father, you are good. Lord, we thank you that you gave of your son for us, that you love us so much, that you sent your son to the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience to go to the cross, to die for us, to take on the weight of our sin and shame. And Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you prepare our hearts for what you have? Lord, would you open our ears to hear what you want us to hear? Direct our minds in the way that you want us to go and soften our hearts to receive what you want us to receive. Jesus, we come to this moment fully present of the work that you want to do. Lord, you're good, and we thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters and called out to the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption's here, your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I want held dear, I count all cross where you love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross. 
So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus in between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews.
When is the last time that you felt guilty about something? Let's think about this for a minute. Is there anything in this last week, or maybe this last month, or this last year? And what is the experience of feeling guilty like? Often when we feel guilty, there's a lot that's happening in our heart, in our mind, and even in our body when we know we've done something wrong, isn't there? Often there might be a feeling of dread that we feel in the pit of our stomach, or we may feel embarrassed and think to ourselves, oh my goodness, what have I done? We may feel scared or uncertain about what happens next. We may feel disappointed in ourselves. And almost all the time when we feel guilty, accompanying guilt is a feeling of shame. And shame activates this strong impulse within us to hide. To feel guilt and shame is incredibly unpleasant. It's terrible, isn't it? And we will do almost anything we can do to avoid feeling this way. We live in a world that's continually giving people a message that we can be whoever we want, we can do whatever we want, and feel completely justified in this. You do you, often we hear people say. Like, as long as you aren't hurting anyone, you do you, whatever you want, and it's all okay. But to be honest, the caveat to not hurt anyone is actually really flimsy. This means different things to different people, for one. And for two, very often we don't have ourselves in view when we say this. Now, we might initially think that this sounds good. I mean, you do you sounds good on the surface, doesn't it? And of course, there's ways that this can be interpreted that are completely fine. But we need to acknowledge that there is the potential for a slippery slope here, even a really dangerous one. Think about it this way. What do you want to be remembered for? At the end of your life, how do you want people to reflect on their experience of you? Like, would it encourage you if you heard similar things to this expressed about you? You know, one thing that stands out about Lisa is that the most important person in the world to her was her. She would always find a way to make sure she got what she needed. She was really good at that. You know, but that being said, though, you could always count on Lisa to have your back. Well, that is, if it was convenient for her. But if it was convenient for her, her loyalty would know no bounds. Do we admire these things in other people? Do we think other people will admire this in us if this is how we choose to live? No, not at all. In fact, often when we pursue ourselves first, in our lives, this can leave us with a feeling of, of disappointment. It can leave us feeling unfulfilled. And depending on what it is that we're engaging in, we can even feel regret and the guilt and shame that come with that. The truth is there's something hard, hardwired within us to admire and aspire to kindness and humility and selflessness. On some level, we recognize that you do you, whatever you want. It just isn't quite right. Well, why is this? The Bible has something to say about this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we see the Apostle Paul speaking to the church about this. He says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. The Apostle Paul is clearly saying here that without Jesus, we will inevitably place ourselves at the center of our own lives. We'll place ourselves on the throne of our own lives and pursue our own desires before anything else. 
And the Apostle Paul says that our own desires apart from God are actually the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. And pursuing the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature brings about only one thing, death. Paul says that apart from God, all of us are dead because of our disobedience in many sins and that by our very nature, we are subject to God's anger because of sin. Now on the surface, this might seem a little harsh, but let's think about this for a minute. We all know the pain that comes from the potential selfishness in this you do you narrative. We all know what it's like to pursue what we want at the expense of someone else and the regret and guilt that so often results. We all know the pain of wishing so desperately that we could just take something back, something that we've said or that we've done in a moment of frustration or selfishness and a lack of generosity. Maybe it's a smug or an arrogant word spoken in just the right moment to let them know exactly what you think of them because after all, they have it coming. Or maybe it's a lie set in haste to cover our tracks because we don't want to be found out and we rationalize it to ourselves thinking, it's okay, what they don't know won't hurt them. Really? But then how come the guilt never shifts and it stays? We all know the devastation of realizing that crossing a good and needed healthy boundary even just one time. And again, we rationalize that we just want to feel a bit of pleasure or a bit of relief. And we think it's something we could easily manage and control. But then realize how quickly it can spiral out of our control and become something that even though we maybe want to resist, we actually end up revisiting over and over again caught in a cycle that we feel helpless and powerless to get out of on our own. We all know the shame that settles on us as we reflect on even one selfish action and how that has impacted not only us, but those around us. Quite often, people around us that we actually deeply love and do not want to treat that way. Sin breaks everything. Sin breaks everyone it touches. And we all know this on some level. Is there any guilt that you carry today? Is there any shame in your life that is causing you to want to hide? Are there any destructive habits or patterns of behavior that you initially thought would be manageable and controllable for you and would maybe even bring some much needed relief But you realize now, if you're honest with yourself, that that actually isn't true. And instead of experiencing relief, you're carrying guilt and shame as a result, and it just won't shift. You do you. Whatever you want, it's fine. Doesn't bring about the good life or the freedom that it promises. In and of ourselves, we are dead in our sins, the Apostle Paul says following the desires and inclinations of our sinful nature apart from God, he describes us. By our very nature, apart from God, apart from Jesus, subject to God's anger, all of us, all of us. This is our standing before God. We are dead in our sins apart from Christ. In our own effort and merit, we are helpless to change this. Guilt, shame, And regret stays just where it's meant to stay, like a bullseye on our chest. You do you does not take care of the guilt problem that we have. You do you does not take care of the shame problem that we face because of our sin. So then where is the Christian hope found? Oh, the perfect son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief and a 
So if we can't appease our guilt or deal with our guilt and shame on our own, then what's the Christian hope? Our culture, Canadian culture, says, you do you and it'll just be fine. This is where the good life is found. But we know at least to some degree that this vision of the good life is wanting. It's wrong. What if there was another way to live? What if there was a different narrative to base our lives on, one that was based in truth, that actually held within it a real way, a real way to address the problem of our sin and the subsequent guilt and shame. And it was actually a gateway to lead to real joy and meaning and purpose in life. 700 years before the first Good Friday, 2,000 years ago, the prophet Isaiah pierced through the thin veneer of our assumption that our best strategy to a full and abundant life is to look out for ourselves first. The prophet Isaiah heralded news of one who would come and free humanity from our hopeless and self-absorbed and self-destructive state and literally embodied the exact opposite strategy for a full and abundant life. He would free humanity by giving up everything he had a right to cling to, so the privileges and rights of his divinity to start, but within this, he gave up his innocence. He gave up his safety. He gave up his security. He gave up his comfort. He gave up his reputation. He gave up everything, everything given, everything surrendered in obedience to God the Father to deal with the problem of our sin to make a way to restore everything that sin is broken for our sake. Though he was innocent of any sin or any wrongdoing, Jesus took the punishment of our sin upon himself when he died on the cross so that we could experience forgiveness and through his forgiveness be restored in our relationship with God and through restoration in our relationship with God experience abundant life with him if we choose to receive it. In Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah describes so, like some of what the experience would have been like for Christ on the cross for us. And these are vivid, raw, graphic words, and yet we realize that there is no way that a written word can actually encompass fully all of what it meant for Jesus to bear the penalty and the cost of our sin. But we are going to read a part of Isaiah 53 and just allow the Lord to minister to us. This is how deeply he loves. In Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4, it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sin. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. In these verses, we get a glimpse of the greatest act of selflessness and sacrifice for the sake of another ever given, period. The prophet Isaiah clearly states that on the cross, Jesus carried everything for us. Jesus did not have the problem. We had the problem. And Jesus carried our weakness. He experienced sorrow that was meant to be ours. He bore guilt that is actually our guilt, but he bore that in his body. And he took our punishment on himself so that we could be free. And Jesus affirms that he did this completely, fully, willingly, and voluntarily. 
In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus affirms this when he says, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And maybe we ask ourselves, why in the world would Jesus do this? How does this make any sense? And certainly when you compare it to the Canadian cultural narrative of like, look out for yourself first, like, like you do you first, it makes no sense. But thankfully, the kingdom of God is different. The Bible has a lot to say about this. So we're going to go back to our passage from Ephesians chapter 2, the passage where Paul described us as being dead in our sins apart from God and subject to God's anger because of our pursuit of our sinful nature. And we're going to see that the Apostle Paul goes on to say that because of God's great love for us, he made a way for us to be united with Christ in his death taking care of our problem with sin and the subsequent guilt and shame that we experience as a result. And when that sin is taken care of, we are united with Christ in his resurrected life, resulting in new life for us, should we choose to receive it. And we're actually going to talk in more detail about what this new life is on Easter Sunday. So come back for Resurrection Sunday because you don't want to miss this. So in Ephesians 2 verses 4 to 6, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And then in the first part of the next verse, Paul says, we were given this grace, this gift, when we chose to believe. So because of his great love for us, Jesus has made a way for us to be restored in our relationship with God and no longer subject to God's anger because of our sin. Jesus sacrificed everything so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made whole, so that we could be healed, and so that we could be free from the guilt and shame that sin brings, if we want to be. Jesus willingly voluntarily stepped into our sin, into our hopelessness, into our self-centeredness, and provides us with a way to be free. So how can we experience the rescue, the hope that Jesus offers? How can we experience this abundant life that's made available to us in Christ? Well, just to be really honest with you, at first, we're likely to feel some resistance to, the, to what we need to do. In fact, quite frankly, many people never get past this first and very foundational step. You see, we have to follow in the way of Jesus and to die. So not a physical death, but death to self. We need to take ourselves out of the center of our own stories. We need to intentionally displace ourselves, take ourselves out of first place in our lives, and give first place to Jesus in everything. Now, this seems counterintuitive, but listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16, verse 25. Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life... So in other words, if you try to live for yourself and do things your way, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, as in if you displace yourself from first place and give that to me for my sake, he says, you will save it. So how does this make any sense? Like what's Jesus getting at? Jesus is saying that it is through this death to self that we actually become able to receive and participate in resurrected life with him where purpose, meaning, and joy is found. You do you is exchanged for Jesus first in everything. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. In Jesus, as we choose to receive his gift of forgiveness and restoration, dealing with the problem of our sin and the subsequent guilt and shame, the old life, the old nature is gone. The life where we're separated from God and subject to his anger because of our sin, gone. A life where guilt and shame are regular companions with us on the journey as a result of our sin, gone. A life where following the desires and inclinations of our sinful nature feels like it's something we can't avoid, gone. And all of this is because God loves us. God loves you and made a way for us. He made a way for you to be forgiven and set free because of the work Jesus accomplished on the cross. Now we're gonna take communion together this morning. And when we take communion, we are reflecting on, remembering, and participating in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If you don't have elements and you're concerned about that right now, I'll just let you know they're here at the front, so don't worry, you haven't missed anything. But when, when we take communion, there's a wafer that you're going to see, and that wafer represents the body of Jesus broken for you. And the juice, when you drink it, that represents his blood that is shed for you. And this beautiful gift given to us through his sacrifice, this beautiful gift of the forgiveness of sins and new life made available to him. This is what we're celebrating as we take communion. And as we come to a time of reflection before we take communion, I have some questions that I want to ask us, me included, just to help us reflect on our hearts as we come into this beautiful time of remembering in such a practical way the work of Christ for us. So if you are here today and you have chosen to receive the gift of new life that Jesus offers to you, his forgiveness, his restoration, and you recognize that the old is gone and you're, you have been offered and are seeking to live in that new life, really simple question for you. Are you fully living in this new life today? Or is there any way that you're clinging to anything from your old life, anything from your old nature? Is there any guilt or shame that you are carrying today that Jesus would like to lift from you? Or are there any choices that you are making that are more in line with the desires and inclinations of your sinful nature and Jesus is inviting you today to leave that old life behind and align yourself once again with his way and with the life that he is making available to you. Remember, the old is gone. You are under no obligation in any way to follow the desires and inclinations of your sinful nature anymore. Jesus, by his spirit, will actively empower you to live according to your new nature and to the new life that he is giving to you. So is there any way that you're living that is actually more reflective of the old, less reflective of the new? Jesus loves you, and he willingly bore the burden of your guilt and your shame and your sin so that you don't have to. Is there anything that you came into this room with today that you want to leave behind? You don't want to take it back out with you. Now, if you're here today and you haven't yet chosen to receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers for sin and make him first in everything in your life, I have a question for you. Is there any reason why you would reject this offer that Jesus is making to you? And this is a good thing to consider because as I said, as we consider this, we have to make the choice. Are we willing to die to ourselves? And this is a serious question. Is there any reason why you would not want to do that to receive the gift of forgiveness and life that Jesus offers you? The alternative, if we choose not to receive the forgiveness and grace of Jesus, then the alternative is actually that we say that we are going to work to overcome the, the consequences and the penalty of sin by our own effort and in our own merit. And the truth about that is, is that we actually cannot do this. 
we cannot do this. We cannot justify ourselves. We cannot deal with the problem of sin and the subsequent guilt and shame on our own. So it just sits. It just stays with us and cycles in our life. And we actually are not able to ever experience lasting freedom. Jesus loves you. And the offer of forgiveness and new life is an invitation that Jesus is extending to you today. And if any of you are here and you would like to make this decision to surrender your life to Jesus and receive his forgiveness, and it would be helpful for you to speak with any one of us on staff about that, I want you to know that we are here and we are eager to speak with you about this. If any of you in this moment want to receive the offer of forgiveness that Jesus is giving you, then a simple place to start is just an expression of your heart to his in prayer. Just, just saying to him, however it makes sense to you, that you want to receive his forgiveness and that you're choosing to take yourself out of center stage in your own life. And you want to learn and grow for Jesus to be first in everything. Just a simple expression of prayer is a great place to start here. And for all of us here today, is there anything that you want to leave behind from your old nature? Anything you came in with that you don't want to take back home with you? The popsicle stick that was sitting on your seat when you came in today is for you this morning. If taking an action step in this decision would be helpful for you today. And I will just say, any time where we're choosing to do something different, to go another way, very often an action step is actually really helpful for all of us just to help set something in our heart and in our intention, in our will. So that popsicle stick is for you to write a word or a statement or something to reflect what you are choosing to leave behind today. So maybe it's guilt or maybe it's shame or maybe it's a belief that you are unloved by God Maybe it's a past sin that even though you've asked for forgiveness, you've received forgiveness, it keeps kind of circling back. So you ask for forgiveness again. And, but maybe Jesus is saying, well, I, I know if you've asked for forgiveness and you've confessed to Jesus and to anybody else that, that you need to confess to, that is gone. That is done. And could be that Jesus is inviting you today to actually really leave it behind for real because it's covered. Jesus doesn't want you to carry that. Or maybe it's a past hurt that just keeps coming back. Maybe there's unforgiveness that's keeping you connected to a past hurt. And Jesus is saying, if you'll trust me in this, if you'll follow my way in this in forgiveness, there's freedom for you. Maybe there's something there. Or maybe it's your old nature and you're here today and you want to give your life to Jesus in a fresh way and you want to leave that old nature behind and take on the new nature that Christ gives you. Whatever it may be, feel free to write it on that popsicle stick. And when you come forward to receive communion, because the elements are here at the front on either side of the stairs, what I would ask you to do is actually go to the sides of the room or the back first before you come up to the front. Because all along the perimeter of the outside of the room on both sides of the auditorium, there are pots filled with dirt. <laughs> And what we would invite you to do is take that popsicle stick, go to one of those pots of dirt, and bury it. Just bury it in deep. And after you've buried that popsicle stick in the dirt, then you can come forward and pick up the communion elements, either for yourself or as a family or with the people you came here with. And then we would invite you to return to your seat. And when you're in your seat again, you can take those communion elements when you are ready. And when you take that popsicle stick and you put it in that dirt, I want to just say you are signifying that you are choosing to leave something behind today. You're choosing to allow it to be buried in exchange for the new life that Jesus is giving you. It's a symbolic act that gives testimony to the truth that your old life is gone. It is buried with Jesus and you are choosing new life in the resurrected life of Jesus. So it's actually a really significant symbolic action that you are taking. 
And once you have done this, once you've buried the popsicle stick and you've come forward and taken the elements and gone back to your seat and taken them, you are free to leave whenever you are ready. Now, we don't want you to feel like you need to rush through this at all. The worship team has a number of songs that they are gonna be singing and leading us through so you can take time to reflect. Take time to sit with Jesus. Take time to come forward. Take time when you're receiving the communion elements. You do not have to rush through this. It's four or five songs that we will sing through. But once you are ready to go, you are free to go. And we thank you for coming today. And we hope to see every one of you on Resurrection Sunday. Because on Resurrection Sunday, we will talk in more detail about what is this abundant life that Jesus has made available for us. So I'm going to pray as we move into this time of reflection. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, that you willingly and voluntarily gave up everything that you had a right to as God, not because you needed to for your sake, but because we so desperately needed you to for our sake. Thank you. Thank you that freedom Thank you that healing and wholeness and restoration is made fully available to us through you and through what you accomplished for us on the cross, dealing with the problem of our sin, dealing with the problem of our guilt and shame. We say thank you. So Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we celebrate the work that you have accomplished for us, God. Lord, would you search our hearts now? Even as we read King David's day in the Old Testament, search me and know me. Search my heart. Test me, Jesus. Lord, would you search our hearts right now as we sit with you? If there is anything, Jesus, that you know that we are carrying that you actually do not want us to carry, you want it dealt with, Lord, would you, would you help us to see that? And would you help us take the steps needed with you to fully live in the freedom that you're inviting us to? Jesus, we want to follow your lead in this because we entrust our hearts and we entrust our lives to you as first in everything. So come, Lord Jesus, show us what we need to see so we can walk more fully in your life. In your name, amen. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure.
Oh 
summed in glory His face at last I shall see Will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me I'm singing how marvelous How wonderful is my song Shall ever be How marvelous How wonderful is my Savior's love for me
Thank you all for coming. Uh, we will play recorded music. You're welcome to continue to stay and just to uh, reflect in this space.